Now let's pick up with chapter 20.2, the subsection of international finance that we're dealing with today. Now, the first thing we're going to pick up with is the value of the dollar, which we've already addressed once, but this is just going to be a quick review because it's important to recognize how difficult it is for many of us to think in terms of how these reciprocal numbers work. So we're just simply going to run through it one more time. So remember, anything that increases the demand for dollars or decreases the supply of dollars will push up the value of the dollar. And that should make just basic common sense. If I had said an increase in the demand for eggs will push up the price of eggs, well, you would say, yeah, oh, well, that sounds like chapter four material on supply and demand. Yeah, I understand that. The same thing works in the foreign exchange markets. Anything that increases demand will, of course, shift the demand curve up, raising the value or the price. Anything that lowers the demand or increases the supply will do the exact opposite. Now, remember, when we appreciate in value, we're always looking at it from the point of view of one unit of our currency. How much does it buy of the other currency? So let's just use a, a made up number again here. Let's assume now that one dollar buys three quarters of a euro or 0.75 of a euro. And now the U.S. dollar appreciates to one dollar equals 0.90 euro. The first thing to recognize again is most people will look at this and say, oh, the euro became more valuable and the dollar depreciated because they see a larger number in front of the word euro. But don't forget, this is how many of those other items can you buy with only one dollar? You only used to be able to buy 0.75 of the euros. Now you can buy a full 0.9. So you can obviously buy more euros with the same dollar. So which one of them became more valuable, the dollar or the euro? Well, clearly now you recognize, yes, the dollar appreciates when the exchange rate changes in this particular direction. You see that the one dollar now buys more euros means the dollar appreciates. And then, of course, the exact same thing would be in the opposite. If anything reduces the demand for the dollar or increases the supply of the dollar, it will push the value of the dollar down the same way it would do for the value of eggs. So that means one dollar U.S. buys less of the foreign currency. So let's take a look at a depreciation in the value of the dollar. It used to be that one dollar bought 0.75 euros. Now one dollar only buys 0.6 euros. Now, this means the dollar depreciated. Even though the number in front of the word euro went down, that doesn't mean the euro fell in value, okay? It means that, what, one dollar doesn't buy as many euros now as it did before. Therefore, the dollar itself must be the one depreciating. So always make sure that you're paying attention to that. When I show you exchange rates, that you make sure that you're interpreting correctly when you see the numbers change, which one of the currencies is the appreciating currency and which one is the depreciating currency. And this leads us straight into this particular slide. The value of two currencies varies inversely, which is just a fancy way of saying if the US dollar is going up in value, then the other currency we're talking about must be going down in value. Since we're comparing euros and dollars, we'll, we'll just continue using that as our example. So if the dollar appreciates against the euro, then by definition, the euro must necessarily be depreciating against the dollar. The two of them cannot appreciate at the same time against each other. That's physically impossible. So if the dollar depreciates against the euro, then by definition, the euro has to be appreciating against the dollar. So always remember that. Now let's take a look at the balance of payments. The balance of payments oftentimes generates a great deal of controversy in people's minds. We talk about this on a regular basis. Politicians talk about it. Uh, we talk about having trade wars and things like that based on the balance of payments. But in order to understand whether uh, we're talking about it correctly, we need to understand what we're talking about. So let's talk about what the balance of payments is. First of all, it's a summary of all the international money flows contained in the balance of payments. The balance of payments is the record of all of the international transactions during a given time period. So let's take a look at the different kinds of international transactions. We group them, group them together under three major categories, where the first two categories are actual real categories, and then the third category, the statistical discrepancy, is just, is just a balancing tool. So 
The first two are the important ones. The first one is called the current account, and the second one's called the capital account. The current account takes, a, takes account of all transactions that are taking place in the short run, things such as trade. So the current account includes all the trade balance. So the trade balance would be the importing and exporting of goods and services. Unilateral transfers, which is a fancy way of saying the, um, the, the, the transfer is only going in one direction, nothing goes back in the other direction. So for instance, US, let's say a hurricane hits Taiwan and the US wants to contribute to rebuilding Taiwan and we give the Taiwanese government money, then the dollar is moving in one direction only, there's nothing moving in, re in return in the other direction. And then net investment income would be, let's assume that the United States has a factory in Brazil and whatever money that um, factory earns, that would be part of, obviously when we repatriate that, those profits back to the US, that would be um, a net investment income and that would also be part of our current account balance. Then the next thing would be the capital account balance. The capital account takes care of or keeps track of investments. That's when we normally think of capital, that would be investments. So let's go ahead and move on and so we'll see how this all works on our next slide. So that current account balance, what does it keep track of? Well, it keeps track of the money flows in trading between two countries. So what can be traded between two countries? First of all, merchandise exports and imports. That's the most obvious one. So if a BMW is manufactured in Germany and sold to the US, that would increase our trade deficit because now we have to pay, rather we are going to be importing something without exporting something. Now, of course, if we export something to um, Germany, such as an Apple computer, that would, that would increase the trade um, surplus for the US and would cause a trade deficit for Germany. Now, it's not just physical items that are traded back and forth, there's also services. So for instance, um, accounting services, banking services, also tourism is counted as an international trade flow. So for instance, if a European, let's say a Frenchman, decides to go on vacation at Disney World in Orlando, Florida, we treat that as an American export of services. Even though we physically don't move the services to Europe, it's moved to a European who therefore goes back to Europe and has had the pleasure of going to Disney World in their heart. And so we consider that to be an export of services. Now, um, money um, flows and in, in investment income, we talked about um, in government grants and private um, funds transfers. So in other words, uh, private charities, um, and the, like I said, the government um, oftentimes donates money for hurricane relief or um, uh, you know, development like in poor countries, oftentimes American foreign aid programs will work on um, trying to help foreign governments with clean water um, initiatives and all kinds of things we, we might do for the, for, for the people in that foreign country. Now, for the US, there happens to be a net dollar outflow in the current account due to something called a trade deficit. What is the trade deficit? There's a formula for it directly below the word trade deficit in red. We have exports, which of course, as we sell goods overseas, that brings money into the United States. And then when we import, the good comes to the US, but the amount of money goes out. So if you take exports minus imports, if that number is negative, it's called a trade deficit. If that number is positive, it's a trade surplus. So a trade surplus means you sold more to foreigners than you bought from them. A trade deficit means you bought more from foreigners than you sold to them. But that's not the whole story. The next thing we need to keep account of is something called the capital account. And the capital account includes, let's just go ahead and read the list together. It's inflows during the foreign purchases of US assets. So remember, let's say a foreigner, uh, the Frenchman, instead of going in on to vacation in Disney World, let's assume that foreigner decided to buy a condo in Miami, in Miami, for the so they could come over here for the winter. It, especially in northern France, it gets pretty cold in the winter time. So let's assume they want to vacation in the U.S. during the winter time. That would be an example of an investment in U.S. assets. Uh, but of course, it could also be the Frenchman decided they wanted to buy a business in the United States. The same thing, or wanted to buy farmland. You know, those are all examples of purchasing U.S. assets. Also, they could have come to New York to go to Wall Street and buy stocks or bonds. 
Let's assume that the Frenchman thinks um, Apple Computer is a really good company and they want some Apple stock in their own personal portfolio. So they send 10,000 bucks to the US to buy US stock in Apple. That again would be an inflow of currencies coming into the United States uh, as foreigners try to buy US assets. And then of course there can be also outflows as, as American citizens buy um, assets in foreign countries and simply reverse the name instead of Frenchman buying American stuff now would be what an American wanting to buy a vacation home in, in France or wanting to buy stock in a French company or things like that. Those would be outflows. And of course, there's a couple of other issues that are relatively smaller compared to the first two, um, such as increases in U.S. official reserves. So, for instance, let's say the U.S. wants to build up some foreign reserves uh, by stockpiling euros. Then, of course, euros would come into the U.S. as the U.S. buys them to stock up on reserves. And, of course, um, uh, an increase in foreign official assets in the U.S. Uh, all of those things uh, would increase the total amount of capital um, coming into the U.S. So for the U.S. currently, there's a net dollar inflow in the capital account because foreigners invest more in the U.S. than the U.S. invests in foreign countries. Now this is a, that's one more thing that we need to take care of uh, is the statistical discrepancy I mentioned earlier. And the problem is, is that we have um, a, a problem with accounting that the outflows in the current accounts and the, in, and the inflow in the capital accounts don't exactly balance each other because we collect the data with uh, different time periods. So sometimes there's going to be a slight discrepancy in the numbers, but it turns out our last point, the last bullet point on this slide is the most important one. The balance of payments always must equal zero. In other words, whatever the trade deficit is on a negative number, there must be a positive number in the capital account. This, this is going to be a mathematical fact that it has to be true because let's, let's think about why this is true. Let's assume that Americans buy more BMWs than Frenchmen buy Apple computers. Let's assume it's a million dollars just to make it a, a round number. So Americans buy a million dollars more of um, um, BMWs than, than Germans buy of American um, computers. So we run a trade deficit of $1 million. Now, what do the Germans do with that million extra dollars that they have received from selling the BMWs than they paid for the Apple computers? What's the chance they're gonna put it in a bonfire and burn it? Well, zero chance of that happening, right? That money has to go somewhere. So if they didn't buy US assets, they must have invested it in the US in some other way. So those Germans who aren't buying that many uh, computers must be investing it in something else. For instance, the German bought a house in Miami in order to have a nice warm place for the winter. My point is the money has to go somewhere. It can't just do nothing. So it turns out that the, the, the um, current account balance, whatever it is, whether it's positive or negative, is exactly offset by the capital account in the opposite direction. So for instance, the US right now is running a trade deficit, but they're also by therefore definition, they're running a capital surplus, meaning foreigners are investing more in the US than they're purchasing in um, goods and services. However, the same thing must be true in Germany. Germans, by the way, are running a trade surplus. The Germans sell a lot of BMWs and other goods as well to foreigners. Now, when the Germans collect all that money, since they aren't spending it on goods and services from those countries, instead they are investing that money by either buying real estate or stocks or bonds or whatever in that country. So the trade surplus that the Germans have in their trade balance is offset by a negative capital account, meaning money is flowing out of Germany in the capital account and being invested in foreign countries. So the two numbers have to exactly offset each other, which of course takes a lot of the argument out of the trade deficit because people only focus on the trade deficit without simultaneously looking at the capital account. So the US runs a huge trade deficit, which upsets a lot of people and gets a lot of politicians talking about starting trade wars. But don't forget, the US has a trade, uh, rather has a capital account surplus 
meaning that foreigners love to invest in the United States, which of course is a good thing. So the trade deficit scares people, but we never seem to pay attention to the capital account, which should be a positive that offsets the trade deficit. Now let's think about some things that are going to increase the demand for dollars. Now we've already done this once before, but let's rem rem remind ourselves of some other things that, that will uh, tend to cause a increasing demand for dollars. And why is that important? If the demand for dollars increases, what should happen to the exchange rate? The US um, dollar becomes more valuable, right? So let's think about this. Um, increasing demand for dollars comes from foreign incomes rising faster than US incomes. So if foreign incomes rise faster, they are in a position to buy more goods from America than Americans are in a position to buy from foreigners. Let's, let's use the example of, again, Apple computers being sold to Germans and German BMWs being sold to Americans. If Germany's income is rising faster than Americans' income, that means Americans are not increasing their BMW purchases very much, but Germans, since they're much richer, are buying way more Apple computers. So that would be an example there of the demand for dollars by the Germans would exceed the amount of demand for euros by the Americans. The same thing is true if foreign prices are rising faster than US prices. If BMWs are rising, rather if the price of BMWs is rising faster than the price of Apple computers, then Americans, when they try to buy BMW, need to buy more euros than foreigners need to buy of US dollars. So we would expect to have uh, an increasing demand um, for um, US dollars by foreigners. Um, foreigners have an increased need for US goods. If for some reason the desire for US computers rises, then you would expect foreigners to have to get a hold of more US dollars to buy those computers. And then of course, last but not least, if US interest rates become higher than in foreign countries, then investors think, let's, let's again use the example of Germany again and US, Let's assume that um, banks in the US pay 7% on CDs, but the banks in Germany only pay 2% on CDs. And you're a German with a, say a million dollars in your account, and you're thinking, where do I wanna put my money? Do I wanna put it in a German bank and only earn 2%, or do I wanna put my money in an American bank and earn 7%? Well, that should pretty well explain itself. It's pretty obvious why all of a sudden the German would say, I've got a bunch of euros, I'm going to go demand U.S. dollars with them so I can get a hold of the U.S. dollars and then put it in an American bank at much higher interest. So if U.S. interest rates become higher than foreign countries, we would expect an increase in demand for dollars. And of course, vice versa. If interest rates in the U.S. are lower, then Americans would do that. They would take American dollars, cash them in, buy foreign currency, and invest it in the banks of foreign governments, of foreign countries, in order to earn the higher interest. And then, of course, now the exact opposite is true for what causes a decrease in the demand for dollars. If U.S. incomes are rising faster than foreign incomes, then we would have what lots of Americans trying to get a hold of foreign currency and uh, obviously not as many foreigners trying to get a hold of American currencies. So that would have a, de a decrease in demand for U.S. dollars. The same thing for if U.S. prices are rising faster than foreign prices, then foreigners are not buying as many American goods. But Americans love the foreign goods because the foreign goods are of lower price and therefore there'd be less demand for, to get a hold of U.S. dollars. And then, of course, I'm not going to go through each and every one of them. They're simply the exact opposite of the previous slide. So just make sure that when you, you, know, you go over this, make sure that you're paying attention to which direction these exchange movements are moving. And then the, the, the last point on this slide is that there are small changes in every one of these issues occurring all the time because the economies of all these different countries are slightly out of sync with each other. So you would expect that the growth rate in different countries will be different, that the price level changes in different countries will be different. All of these things are constantly changing. The foreign exchange market automatically through supply and demand constantly adjusts to these changes. So there's always going to be somebody, if you're interested in getting hold of a euro for whatever reason, you want to go on vacation in Europe, there will always be someone who wants to provide you with that euro because the exchange rate will either rise or fall until the number of foreigners who want to get a hold of U.S. dollars exactly equals the number of U.S. citizens who want to get a hold of the foreign currency 
So the two of them are willing to work out a deal and swap currencies at a particular exchange rate. So the exchange rate does for foreign currencies exactly what the market price does for gasoline, for eggs, for houses, for whatever it is that are being bought and sold. We always have the same number of buyers and sellers on both sides of a market because the market price is the price necessary to get the supply equal to the demand.